Good morning and welcome to Southern Hills this morning. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors this morning, as well as uh, welcome those of you joining us via live stream. Uh, again, welcome to Southern Hills. If you did not get a chance to pick up a bulletin on the way in, I encourage you to pick up one of those. It has a lot of uh, information about things going on here at Southern Hills and our sick and shut-in list. Uh, we do want to continue to remember all of those who are dealing with the COVID-19 virus and all their family members. Uh, that being said, Dan Cotton um, has tested positive for COVID-19 virus. I uh, want to remember him in our prayers. He did go to the hospital this morning. Uh, they will be keeping him today and tonight uh, for observation and to make sure that they, uh, they keep that under control for him. Uh, that being said, it's going to change class a little bit this morning, but here's, the, here's what the elders have uh, have decided to do. Daniel Winkler will be teaching here in the auditorium and class will be live streamed. So if you're worshiping in the fellowship hall, you're asked to stay in the fellowship hall for class and class will be live streamed uh, back there. Also this coming up Wednesday, Garrett Bookout will be taking care of the five o'clock service um, and ladies Bible class will be taught by Sharon Broom. So all of those things will be going on just to change up of who is, who is going to be speaking. Uh, but those are the announcements that I have for this morning. If you would bow with me in prayer as we begin our service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time as we gather around your throne and worship your name. We pray that everything that we say and everything that we do is done in accordance with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Our first number this morning is 843. 843. Don't
As we continue reading through 1st and 2nd Corinthians this year, I'd like to draw your attention to 1st Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse number 18. 1st Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse number 18, Paul writes these words. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where's the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together this morning so that we can worship and learn more about you. Lord, these are trying times, and we ask that you help bring unity to this country. May you be with our leaders as they guide our country, and we pray that things can return to normal. Lord, we say a special prayer for those here at Southern Hills. May you be with and comfort Brother Danny and any others that are dealing with COVID or other ailments. We pray that you also comfort the shut-ins that are unable to attend today. Could you be with Southern Hills' efforts to evangelize the community? We pray that you bless the efforts of our elders, deacons, and ministers as they teach and guide us. Most of all, we thank you for the forgiveness granted through your son. In his name we pray, amen. After this song, we'll partake in the Lord's table.
this first day of the week, we have the opportunity to observe the Lord's Supper. I'd like to read to you from Matthew 26 when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, just so we'll understand his thoughts. Start in verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's take advantage of this time we have, first day of the week, to enjoy sweet fellowship with our, our Savior. If I could ask you to pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we live in a turbulent world, a world where danger exists around every corner. And Father, we know that we may have put our hope in things of this world, but there's only one hope, and that is your Son and your plan for salvation. Father, we thank you for this memorial feast we observe each first day of the week. Father, we thank you for putting it in place so we would not forget the great sacrifice that your Son gave for us. Father, we pray now for the bread that represents his body that was willfully given on the cross. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I could ask you to pray with me again as we pray for the, the cup. Father, we thank you for Jesus' blood. The only thing that gives us hope of eternal life and covers us and makes us white in your sight. Again, Father, we're thankful for this memorial that we do every week to help keep fresh on our minds what Jesus did for us. Father, we pray for the, the fruit of the vine that you've prescribed in your word as a symbol of that blood that makes us pure in your sight. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
now that we've concluded the Lord's Supper, we're also commanded to, to lay by and store the first day of the week so that the work here can continue at this place. I could ask you to pray with me again, please. And we'll pray now for the uh, contribution. Father in heaven, we acknowledge you as being all powerful and all knowing. Father, we, we praise you and we thank you for making a path forward for us to have the hope of eternal life and we alone could never deserve that. Father, we pray now that each of us will look into our heart and reject selfishness and hope in our possessions and our money and our worldly things. And Father, we pray that we will all realize what a great gift you've given us and comprehend that we are to play a part in spreading the gospel. Father, we pray that each of us will do what we need to do to help more people around us see the truth and come to a right understanding of, of your word. Father, you tell us that we're to lay by in store so that the work will, will proceed here. Father, we pray that we will each do what we need to do to advance your church here at this place and worldwide. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of invitation after the lesson is 613, Take My Life and Let It Be, 613. And before Brother Garrett uh, brings us our sermon this morning, we'll sing 298. 298, would you please be standing?
you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open to that passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'll be there in just a moment. Uh, before I get to this passage, though, I want to talk a little bit just about the concept of discipline. Uh, actually, what, what I'm going to be doing is just kind of give you a, a heads up. Uh, over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about discipline. The Bible has a lot to say about it. Uh, when, when we think of discipline, the word actually means the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior using punishment to correct disobedience. Okay, so when you think of Christianity, there are definitely rules. There's definitely a code of behavior. There's a certain way that God wants his people to behave. It's always been that way. In the Old Testament, God had a certain way he wanted his people to behave. Today, in the New Testament, there's a certain way God wants his people to behave. And it's not always the most natural way of acting. There's often a challenge to becoming those types of people, to learning to treat people the way God wants us to treat people, learning to speak the way God wants us to speak, learning to behave the way God wants us to behave. And so what we have to do is practice that. Okay, and so it's not natural. And, and what's going to happen is, is we will stumble along the way. There's no one who lives perfect, right? And so it, there, there's a discipline, it's a training, and, and at times even a punishment towards uh, those who, who, I guess, disobey the rules. We often think of parenting, right? Where, where you're training a child and, and children obviously aren't going to obey their parents perfectly. Anyone who's ever raised children know that. And so you discipline them, but it's, it's all for the purpose of training. It's not a bad thing. It's, it's a good thing. And, and as you think about discipline, there's different types of discipline that, that the Bible addresses. For example, our lesson today is going to be on self-discipline. I need to discipline myself, all right, we could talk about looking at others, but before we do any of that, I need to look at myself and, and I need to train myself and I need to work on myself and I need to make sure that I practice certain behaviors. And if I don't, I need to work on me. The Bible also speaks about church discipline. When we think of church discipline, we often think of like disfellowship and that's part of it. And, and we'll address that, but it's more than just that. I want you to be right with God and, and you want me to be right with God. And so I, I want to help you in any way that I can. And, and you want to help me in any way that you can. We want to discipline each other. And, and there's actually a lot to that. So we're going to have several lessons that deal with church discipline and how we help each other and train each other uh, to have the right behavior. And, and, and kind of the right code of conduct. And then we'll talk about God's discipline. The Bible also says that God disciplines us. And, and we'll speak about some of those different things. And so I think the lessons are going to take about five weeks, I guess, starting this week. And so I got about five lessons scheduled that I'm going to, to go throughout this with the series. And so just kind of a heads up for what's coming on. Uh, today, we're going to get back into our topic of self-discipline. And I've titled this lesson, Discipline My Body. And, and that comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, particularly verse 27 is the passage that I want to spend probably the most time on. But before we get to verse 27, I want to walk you through the context a little bit so you know why Paul is saying what he's saying in that passage. Okay, you might be aware of this. You probably are. When Paul sat down to write to the church at Corinth, he was writing to a congregation that had a lot of problems. I mean, it's kind of an interesting book, the way that it's written. Like you just read through it and, and Paul says things like, okay, now concerning this and now concerning this and now, con and it's just like this list of problems that you guys are doing wrong and you need to straighten up. Okay. And so what it seems to all kind of stem back towards is divisiveness. Like they're just not getting along. They're button heads. And, and when you think of divisiveness, what it obviously comes down to is there, there are certain things that some people say are wrong and other people say are right. 
They have disagreements about the word of God. They have disagreements about what is right and what is wrong. Really, the context of chapter 9 starts back in chapter 8 when he's dealing with, the, with, with eating of meats. Okay, so they have this kind of unique situation in which um, Corinth had a lot of idolatry in it. And animals were offered to different idols. Okay, so they have this problem, and, and some people would see meat offered to idols, and they would think then, because what, what would happen after they offered meat to idols is that meat would be cut up and butchered up and, and kind of sold in the market. And so there were people who said, like, you shouldn't eat that meat. All right, who's benefiting from it? Well, it's, 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 it's the idolatrous people who are making money off of it. The animal itself was offered in an ungodly practice. And, and so I don't see how you could eat. It's wrong to, to buy that meat. You're purchasing something from somebody who is profit. It, it's similar to, we hear arguments about a different kind of boycotting today. You shouldn't go to this restaurant or this place or this store or this, because you're giving your money to these sinful people, right? And, and, and they're using this money in sinful practices. Similar type of arguments to that. Why would you buy meat from this when that money goes to these idolatrous practices? And, and so Paul gets into the discussion of strong and weak brethren. And it's kind of interesting because it's different than what we usually think. We often think, and I don't think we're the only ones, we often think of the strong brethren as kind of the restrictive brethren. The people who see the sin, you know, and, and other people don't see it, but I can spot, you know, scripture doesn't say it's sin, but I know it is because I, th- and, and he says, no, those are actually the weak brethren. Strong brethren, no, it's just meat. Meat's meat. Right? There's nothing inherently right or wrong about that cow. It's just meat, and I'm just eating it. Right? And so it doesn't make you sinful to eat meat. Because you bought it from them doesn't mean you're supporting their practice. You just need to eat. And it's food. And food's okay. And you can eat that food. And it's like you have this strong and this weak, but, but a weak brother is a weak brother, right? And a weak brother is not going to understand that. And a weak brother is going to fight against that. And so Paul, who's like this really strong Christian, said, okay, well, if it's going to help my weak brother, I won't eat it. It's going to bother him. So I won't. And you just think about that. What Paul says in chapter 8, verse 13, is that he would never eat meat again. I think of that and I think, okay, what am I willing to give up to keep division from happening? What am I willing to stop doing? And as you go into chapter nine, you realize Paul gives up quite a bit. Chapter nine, the beginning part says he has the right to take along a believing wife, but he doesn't do it. He gave up that free, he gave up the freedom of being married because people had a problem with it. He had the right to expect the Corinthians to pay him for his ministry there. But he never took a dime from them. He gave up his finances. He gave up his, his family life. He gave up the the eating of me. Like, what is Paul willing to give up? And what you'll find is Paul will give up anything to strengthen the brethren. And it's not only for the brethren, it's for people in the world as well. He will change who he is. He will change his customs and his cultures to be right with, and, and, and just for a chance to win brethren to Christ or, or people to Christ. So in chapter 9 and verse 17 or 19, he says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside of the law, I became as one outside of the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. 
to the weak, I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I read that and I don't know about you, but I read that and I ask myself, what am I willing to do? What customs, what, what culture of mine that I've grown up with? Like, I'm, I'm not outside of the law of God. I'm still under the law of Christ, right? So I still got to be faithful to God. We're not talking about sinning here, but what am I willing to do? Am I willing to dress different? Am I willing to act different in some scenarios? Am I willing to behave different in some? Like, there are places in Scripture where we read about, I think it's Acts chapter 21. Paul actually took like this, this vow and he, he took this oath of purification and he went to the temple. And he went through all this ritual practices. He knew that it meant nothing, but it helped him win Jews. Like, would you do that? Would I do that? To the weak, he would become as weak. I mean, if, if I can't eat meat, I won't eat meat. I'll give up meat. Like, what am I willing to do to connect w- with each other? What am I willing to do to connect with the world? I think sometimes uh, I'm just speaking from, from like personal experience. Maybe I haven't done enough. I think sometimes the church could do better in trying and making an attempt to reach the world around us. And you'll notice the parts I put in red. Why did he do all of that? That I might win more of them in order to win the Jews, that I might win those under the law, that I might win those outside of Christ, that I might win the weak, that by all means, I might say something like Paul was like extremely interested and focused on winning people to Christ. And sometimes our customs and our cultures get in the way of that. And Paul says, well, I'll just change my custom and my culture. I'll change the way I dress. I'll I'll change the things I do. Some people would have a problem with him making tents on Saturday. I won't make tents on Saturday, right? Some people are completely fine with it. Then I'll do it. Some people, like, it's just like, he'll change his culture to reach people. Okay. And so he says in verse 23, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in his blessings. I want you to recognize that about Paul. He did it all for the sake of the gospel. To Paul, the gospel was just so important that he didn't want anything about himself to get in the way of sharing it with people. Like you need the gospel. I need the gospel. The gospel is this beautiful thing, has these wonderful blessings. And and I don't want anything about who I am to get in the way of me and you sharing in those blessings together. Now, what's interesting about that is that if we're going to share, two things have to happen. You have to receive it and I have to be faithful to it also. And so Paul says, and kind of uses this illustration of athletics. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. A couple things that, that just strike me about this passage. First of all, is this discussion of a prize. And, and like, that's why people compete. They want to win. Okay, so we have these sports that, that come around every, what, two years, I guess, four years if you go. But, like, you, you, have, you have the Olympics, right? The Winter Olympics and the Summer Olympics. And it's amazing how much people, uh, how much work and effort these people go through in order to win, that's what they all want to do. They all want to win. And, and we know that in order to win, they don't just wake up the morning of the Olympics and say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to try to go run a marathon. They don't just wake up the morning of the Olympics and say, I'm going to see how fast I can run a hundred meter dash. Like, like, no, they train for it and they train for it and they train for it. And they all do it with this, with this hope of winning this perishable wreath. 
it's kind of funny, isn't it? That, that like when, when we talk about the Olympics, like a lot of our Olympics stemmed from this culture. Right, the Greek culture, like they had these games, they're called the Isthmian games. And like, like it was kind of like our Olympics and they all came together and they just competed and it was so important. It was about pride and national pride and they wanted to win it for themselves and they wanted to win it for others. And it was like so, so, so important. And at the end of it, they get this little like wreath placed upon their head. If you've ever seen one of those wreaths, it's, like just made of leaves and like twigs and like they just kind of bind it together. And, and, and how long does that last? Not real long. Paul says, okay, I want you to think of that. And then I want you to think of our prize. What are, what, what are you going for? What are you fighting for? What are you, what are you running your race for? And it's not like, it's not a perishable wreath. It's, it's a prize that's imperishable. And I want you to recognize that, that, that Paul had this idea of, of this prize is so important to him. Like it was just the, the goal of his life is to win this race. Kind of like a race of life. And, and he sees life as just something he's going through, but he's got this goal and this focus in mind that he just wants to win it. And, 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 and so in order to do that, what, what's true with, with athletes and what's true with you and me, there's this thing called self-control. I don't know if you've ever attempted to, comm- uh, to, to perform like a great athletic feat. So some, you want to train for a marathon, it's, it's going to take some work. When you think about Olympians and, and you see what they go through, like, again, like they don't just wake up and decide to do it. It takes months, years of their lives they've trained. And if you've ever looked through some of these athletes, I remember looking, like I, I looked at like the, the training schedule of Michael Phelps one time. Like he wakes up probably before most of us are up in the morning and, and he's working out and his body, he works out so much. I, I forget the exact number, but the amount of calories he had to eat in a day is like astronomical in order to just maintain weight because he's working out so much. And so he has to eat like almost all throughout the day. He has to wake up in the middle of the night just to have a meal so his body can be ready to, to work out the next day. You ever think that there's mornings that he thinks, I don't want to get up this morning. I'm tired of eating fish. Like I, I want something else. Right? I, want, I want something fatty or I want something like just high calories and, and just really, really bad for me. But, but no, it's like this, this specific diet day in and day out specific workout regimen and routine. And, and, and it's not just like the lifting weights and the swimming, but, but you also got to do like therapeutic type things. He has to go through massages and stretch. Like it, there are times where he probably feels, I don't want to do this, but he's got a goal that he wants. He just run like that, live like that. Like there's something you're trying to obtain, something that is far better than a perishable wreath that you have in your grasp and you have before you and work for that. He goes on and says, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. I don't run aimlessly. Like there's a point to it. We talked about that a little bit last week. Like in my life, there's, there's a goal. There's a point. There's an aim. There's something I'm going for. There's a prize that I have before me and that I want to win. And so I've got this goal in mind that I'm aiming for, that I'm going. I don't beat as one just beat in the air. Like I have something I'm actually trying to accomplish. I have goals and feats and things that I'm trying to do. And so we get to verse 27 and verse 27, I want to, I want to pay a little closer attention to. It's really what the, the, the passage I was wanting to get to. I want you to notice when he says in verse 27, he starts with, with, but, which is a, a conjunction, which, which basically means he's, 
and he's contrasting it to what he said before. I don't run aimlessly. I don't, I don't fight as one box in the air. Like I don't, I don't prepare for nothing. My life isn't about just, just doing whatever. Like I have a goal. I have a purpose. I have an aim. So I don't do that, but instead of, of, of living aimlessly and running aimlessly, I discipline my body. I want you to notice also the, he, the, 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 the I and my and myself. Remember who we're talking about here. Because we're talking about disciplining the body and, and the work that he has to go through. And when I think of Christianity and I think of the Apostle Paul, like what you're talking about is probably like one of the most dedicated Christians you're ever going to read about. Like you read through scripture and this guy, I mean, he talked about it already. Like he'd give up being married for the cause of Christ. He'd give up money for the cause of Christ. He wouldn't eat meat anymore. For the, there's nothing he wouldn't do. And, and you just read about his life. And like he just traveled from place to place and preached the gospel. Times he was beat for it. And times where he's in prison for it. Ultimately killed for it. And you just read about this guy who seems to be so dedicated. And, and what you have to realize is as he talks about disciplining his body, it wasn't easy for him either. And that's what he says. I discipline my body and keep it under control. Do you realize there were times where Paul didn't want to keep doing what he was doing? Like that athlete that wakes up in the morning and says, I don't want to run today. I don't want to eat that today. Like the athlete who, who wants to hit the snooze or just turn the alarm off in the morning. Paul had times where he was tired. Paul had times where, where, where like you and me, he went through difficult things and he was challenged and the temptations you face, he faced. So many in the world give in to these temptations and these sins before him. And guess what? Paul was tempted to do that also. But he wouldn't allow it. He disciplined himself. He brought his body under control. It's kind of interesting. Like we're reading chapter nine and verse 27. The context actually doesn't stop here. If you go into chapter 10, he's still talking about that. Chapter 10 and verse 13, he's talking about temptation. And he says, no temptation has overtaken you as such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with each temptation will make a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. Like this idea is that like you're going to be tempted. There's going to be temptation in front of you all of your life. You, me, Paul, God won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. Every temptation that comes before you, you can defeat But you got to discipline your body. You have to bring your body under control. You have to make yourself. There's never going to come a point where you don't want to sin. You read the church at Corinth, they had sexual immorality, they had pride issues. They had all kinds of, of just, just destructive behaviors that they were part fighting and bickering. And, and guess what? Throughout your life, you're going to want to do those things. You got to control yourself. You have to bring your body into subjection. Teach, your, teach yourself, no, I might want to but I won't. My flesh might desire it, but no. Like, I have to discipline myself. And if I'm thinking, if Paul had to discipline himself, if Paul throughout his life had to work on self-control and discipline, then certainly I do too. Why would he do this? Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. 
the word disqualified, it goes back to that kind of that sports analogy that he's been using. I always think as I watch the Olympics, one of the saddest things is not necessarily people who just come in second or third or fourth or fifth place. I don't know if you've ever watched it, but like there have been a couple of times where I've been watching people get ready to, to run the hundred meter dash. And like before the gun, they step and they're okay. And I think they get one warning and they get back on the block and they do it again. And guess what? They don't even get, they're disqualified. They don't even get to run the race. They're not even in contingent. And it's like all that work, all those months, all those years of waking up and, 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 and discipline and, and self-control and eating what you didn't want to eat and working and strength training, all those different things. And, you don't, and you're just disqualified. And Paul said, look, I've talked about some of the things I've done. We could talk about my missionary journeys and you could talk about the places I've gone. You could talk about the preaching that I've done in this place and this place and this place and this place. You could talk about the people that I've brought to Christ. You could talk about all this stuff. But if I don't discipline myself, if I don't control my own desires, if I don't get control of my own body, then I'm disqualified. Doesn't matter all that I've done. Doesn't matter all the training. But God, I stopped eating meat. But, but God, I didn't get married. And I didn't take the money and I didn't do this. And I went there and I preached here and I preached there and I did all this. Yeah, but you didn't control your own desires. You didn't bring yourself into subjection. You didn't control yourself. You participated in all the sins that you preached against. And Paul says, then I myself am disqualified. It doesn't matter all the training. It doesn't matter all that I've done. If I don't control myself, I'm disqualified. And so when we talk about self-discipline and we talk about discipline, before anything else, it starts with an individual responsibility. We're going to talk about church discipline. We're going to talk about what I might be able to do to help you and what you might be able to do to help me. But before any of that stuff happens, one of the things I have to notice about myself and you have to notice about yourself is that before any of that, we've got to learn to look at ourselves and control it. I know as I look throughout this congregation, there's not a person here who won't have temptation in their life. You never get beyond it. There'll never come a point where you say, you know what? I'm just not tempted to sin anymore. Maybe the sins you're tempted with are different than the sin, but you will always face desire and you'll always face temptation. You'll always have struggle in one way or your flesh will want to win out. And then Paul says, yeah, but you got to control that. You can't let it. You have to discipline yourself. Next week, we'll talk about at least start the conversation about church discipline. I have to discipline myself, but if I discipline myself, what can I do to help you discipline yourself? What can I do to, to help you follow God the way you need to follow God? And what can you do to help me? And so we'll talk about that over the next couple of weeks. If there's anyone in here this morning who's not yet a Christian, we would love to help you become one. Uh, we'd love to help you in any way that we can. I, if we can sit down and study with you God's word, that would be our great desire. We would love to sit down and study with you. If we can pray for you, we would love to offer your name before God in prayer. If we can baptize you, if there's anything we could do to help anyone in their relationship with God, we would love to help in any way that we can. I want to say this. It, it, we know that I'm in here with you and you're in here with me. There's also people in, in, in the multi-purpose room. And, and this invitation goes for us all. Uh, if, if you're in here and, and you need to respond to this invitation, we give you the opportunity to sit on the front row. If, if you're in the back in the multi-purpose room, there is an elder at the front who would receive you and be willing to do the same thing. And so if there's anybody in here, back there, who needs to respond to God this morning in any way, uh, we offer you this invitation uh, to respond as we stand to sing this invitation song.
Thank you so much, Brother Garrett. Looking forward to the rest of the series. As was mentioned, we do have Bible class following uh, this closing song and prayer. We'd love for each one of you to stay with us. Daniel Winkler is going to be teaching here in the auditorium. Those that are in the fellowship hall right now are asked to stay in there, and we will live stream there. We also invite you back to worship with us this evening at 5 p.m., and then Wednesday night for Bible class at 5 and 7. We'll sing one closing song before we're dismissed in prayer. me, please. Dearly Father, we are so thankful for this day, and Father, we're thankful for this opportunity, for this place to come and worship Thee, we pray, in spirit and in truth. Father, we're thankful for the lesson that we've heard from Brother Garrett this morning, and and Father, as we go throughout our lives, we, we know we st should strive to be the best that we can be in, in all that we do. But Father, more importantly, we pray as we um, live for Thee, that we live this life in a way that we can have that imperishable crown to live with Thee in heaven forever and ever. Father, we pray for those who are sick. We pray for uh, Brother Cottrell that um, he will be able to recover quickly. We know there are others who are sick and hurting, and we pray blessings upon them and their families. Father, we're thankful for our teachers and and so many that do so much behind the scenes here at this place. and. And Father, we pray blessings upon them. Father, bless us and, and keep us safe and forgive us of our sins. And we're so thankful for that perfect sacrifice of thy son that, that makes heaven a possibility for us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.